Crackles, I got so many answers to that question, I wouldn't even know where to start. Hello, Lost fans. It's me, Shawnee B, with a great show for you today. We're going to talk about everything that happened in the 12th episode of Season 6 called Everybody Loves Hugo. And like I said, the episode was called Everybody Loves Hugo. It was referencing the episode in Season 2 called Everybody Hates Hugo. And it's similar to the episode this season, What Kate Does, referencing What Kate Did seasons before. Alrighty, it is time for the Fast Reflex Awards. <laughs> And boom goes the dynamite. Congrats to the 10 people down here. You guys were the fastest last week, so good job. If you want your name to be mentioned in these recaps, just let me know what the fast image is, and I'll put one in each video and when it is. If you're one of the top five people, you'll be mentioned in the next recap. All right, before I start, I just wanted to talk about one thing that I didn't mention in the last recap, which I plan to talk about. The only people that have organic flashes, meaning people that have had visions without the help of others, are people who have died in the original timeline, like Daniel, Charlie, and Libby, and people who haven't died in the original timeline, like Desmond and Hurley, they needed help from others. Again, just something I wanted to bring up, so then, let's get started. So we start off with Pierre Chang, who, for some reason, hasn't appeared to age much since 1977. He's giving a presentation about chicken lover Hugo's life and his Mr. Cluck's empire. Pierre Chang isn't working for Dharma, but he is narrating a video presentation still. Hurley's donating to the museum that Chang and Charlotte are working at, so he's honored as Man of the Year and given a sweet T-Rex trophy. His mom says everybody loves Hugo, except women. That's nice. She sets him up on a date with a girl named Rosalita. So Hurley goes to Spanish Johnny's the next day, anxiously awaiting when Libby appears. Hurley wasn't expecting, well, that, and acts like a little nervous boy. I think she's looking at me. He finds out that she isn't Rosalita and asks how she knew his name. She holds his hand and asks him if he believes that two people can be connected as soulmates and asks him if he remembers her. Right when he says, uh, no, dude, <laughs> Dr. Brooks, the same doctor that was Hurley's psychiatrist in the original timeline, interrupts them and takes Libby away. They leave in the crazy van. Depressed Hurley goes to a Mr. Clucks and notices a man staring at him. It's Desmond and he comes over to sit by Hugo. Hurley tells him about Libby, but that she's nuts because she claims that they already know each other. Desmond tells him to follow his gut and see if she's right. Cupid then leaves when his order is ready. Order number 42. So Hurley goes to the Santa Rosa Mental Institute and meets with the doctor, asking him if he can see Libby. This scene looked almost exactly similar to the scene in Dave, except Hurley was in the place as a patient. And just in case he forgot, remember, Libby was also a patient in the original timeline too. Also, we see a picture of an island in the background of his room here, as well as a chalk drawing of an island in the rec room. Hmm. When Hurley asks him about seeing Libby, Brooks is like, uh, ah, nah. So Hurley bribes him with 100 Gs, and the greedy man changes his mind. We next see Libby sitting with Hurley, and he asks her where she thinks she knows him from. She claims that when she saw him on TV, all these memories came rushing back to her from her life, except it was another life where they liked each other. He asks her out on a date, and they go to the beach for a cheese picnic, where Libby tells him that she likes him. Aw oh, yeah, big boy. Hurley kisses her like a champ, maybe trying to get all that cheese flavor out. This is like totally Hurley's perfect day. I never knew there could be such a thing as a perfect day. And right when they kiss though, Hurley gets visions of all the times they shared together on the island and tells Libby that he remembers some stuff, just like Desmond did last episode. And speaking of Desmond, he watches his work as the modern day Cupid from his car then happily drives off. He goes to the school that Ben and Locke work at and watches as Locke wheels his way to his car. Ben pops up and thinks that Desmond is a pedophile for watching the kids or something. Desmond makes up a story about wanting his son to join the school and Ben tests him asking what his son's name is. Without hesitation, Desmond says Charlie, which really is his son's name in the original timeline. I think this is just another clear example of how both Desmond's and both timelines seem to know about both the realities, at least so far it seems. So Ben leaves and Desmond starts his car, drives like he's trying to reach 88 miles per hour or something, and rams into poor old Locke. Ben comes to help, and while Locke doesn't look dead, 
he seems seriously injured. It's kind of funny too, because in the original timeline, we know that Ben was the one who killed Locke, but in this timeline, he's the first one to rush to his aid when he gets hurt. So one of the big questions from this episode is, why exactly did Desmond hit Locke with his car? Well, there's a lot of different possibilities out there, but the ones that seem the most possible are that either Desmond was trying to kill him, which I'll talk about in just a little bit, or that Desmond was trying to give him that near-death experience to get that deja vu feeling, similar to how Charlie tried to give Desmond his near-death experience so he could have that feeling too. If it's true that he was trying to get him to have this near-death experience, it would go along with what he said at the end of last episode, I just need to show them something. And also remember, in the original timeline, Locke could walk again once he crashed onto the island. So maybe after crashing here, Locke will remember that point from the original reality. We know that it's Jack's episode next, so I think Locke will be rushed to the hospital to be saved by Jack and possibly even operate on him so he can give him the ability to walk again. This could open up Locke's eyes similar to Desmond, Daniel, Charlie, and Hurley. And like I said before, the other idea on why Desmond ran over Locke was maybe with the full intention of actually killing him. The main reasoning for this is that Desmond seems to have an awareness of both timelines and thought that he was the man in black. I don't think it was revenge for throwing him down the well as we'll see later in this episode because after he rammed into Locke, he didn't seem angry or excited or nervous like he had good reason for doing this, like it was supposed to happen. In the original reality, the man in black is Locke. Everyone has an alternate self in the other reality, so by Desmond eliminating Locke in this flash sideways timeline, since we already know the real Locke is also dead in the original timeline, both Locks, both real Locks have ceased to exist possibly making it so the Man in Black couldn't survive with Locke's appearance. But of these two ideas though, I agree more with the first one that Desmond did it not to try and kill him, but to try to give him that near-death experience and also to try and lead him to Jack. Okay, now let's go over everything that happened on the island this episode. Okay, I'm gonna break this up into two parts. The first part being everything that happened with Hurley's group, and then the last part will be everything that happened with Flock's group. So Hurley starts out at Libby's grave when Alana comes over and tells him that they need to get some dynamite to blow up the plane. Once she leaves though, we hear whispers. There were two sets of whispers in this episode, and I'll start with the first one and the second one I'll show you later in the recap. I'll go over what all of them say. It's big thanks to Tiki Box as always, Paper Odyssey, and Penny Yours from the Fuselage for once again doing a great job at deciphering these audio tracks. So here's the first set, and keep in mind that there's a lot of tracks over each other in different channels, backwards and forwards, so they aren't super clear. I'll play it twice for you and put down what they possibly say. Okay, here it is again. Okay, now during that first set of whispers, you probably heard a woman speak a little bit louder than the others. I'll play that part again for you guys a bunch of times. It kind of sounds like she's saying, they're supposed to be laid to rest. But here's the thing, if that whisper's reversed and slowed down a tiny bit, it sounds more like Libby speaking, or maybe another woman saying, it's happening, it's almost over. Or some people even hear, stay tuned, it's almost over. Let me know which one you hear. I'll play it for you guys a few times. <laughs> Michael appears and claims that he came to prevent everyone from getting killed, telling Hurley that a lot of people will die if they blow up the plane. Later at the beach, Alana tells Richard that she got four sticks of dynamite, when Hurley stands up and tells him that he doesn't think it's a good idea. Ilana says that Jacob told Richard to blow up the plane so that thing can't leave the island, and that's what they're gonna do. Right when she says that, she drops the bag and... And boom goes the dynamite. She goes kablooey. <laughs> and right after that, Hurley rummages through her stuff and finds the bag with Jacob's ash inside and takes it. Richard takes the lead and tells the group that they have to get more dynamite to blow up the plane, and Hurley speaks up by saying he agrees, so they all head back to the Black Rock. But they notice Hurley's not with them. Then they see the big guy running towards them yelling, RUN! as the ship blows up. And boom goes the dynamite. Richard shrieks, why did you do that? And Hurley's all, dude, I'm protecting you. But Richard doesn't think so, walking off and saying they're all doomed. Miles goes up to Hurley and asks why he did that. Hurley tells him that Michael told him to and that Michael is one of the dead people who come to yell at him, but that he does what they say because dead people are more reliable than living people. Richard wants to go to the barracks to get grenades, but Hurley thinks that they should talk to Flock, 
because Jacob told them so and that he's standing right nearby. Richard doesn't believe him and asks, okay, if he's there, ask him what the island really is because he told me what it is. Hurley's lying about Jacob being there, so he walks up by Richard and tells him that he doesn't need to prove anything. Richard yells to the group that Hurley is a liar because Jacob never tells people what to do. So the group splits up into two. Miles and Ben join Richard, while Jack, Son, and Frank follow Hurley to talk with the man in black. 